When the wire cutter was acquired by the New York Times for a reported $30 million back in 2016, it instantly became one of the most valuable affiliate websites in the world. What's pretty amazing about that is that founder Brian Lamb spent just five years building the site up. Since then, it's continued to dominate in the affiliate space, ranking for over 7.2 million keywords and generating traffic upwards of 13 million hits per month. Hey there affiliate schoolers, and in this video I wanted to see if we could learn anything from the way in which the wire cutters structure their content, and take a look at just how they remain competitive across so many different niches, and still manage to adhere to the Google product review guidelines. We'll also be taking a quick look at how the wire cutter came to be, and it might even give you some encouragement with your own sites. What this video is not going to do is teach you how to compete with the likes of the wire cutter. I love a David and Goliath story as much as the next person, but going head to head with wire cutter is going to lead to disappointment. Instead, like all good underdog stories, you're going to have to think smarter to outwit this opponent, but I still think it's worth taking a look at the way in which they structure their site and how it's grown over time. Before we jump into my top takeaways from the wire cutter, if you love all that is affiliate and SEO, consider subscribing to the channel because that's what we talk about here. But that's enough of that, let's get on with this and jump right in. Probably the first thing that you notice when you look at the Wirecutter website is just how many niches they cover. And it seems like they cover pretty much everything. But they do structure their content into content hubs and you could almost treat each of these categories as a website in its own right. Now of course they have access to tons and tons of resources, lots of writers, but they still do the basics right too and that's what we're going to be looking at today. So if we start off in the coffee niche and that's, that comes under their kitchen section, which clearly makes sense. And if you're a regular on the channel, you will know that I'm pretty well versed with the coffee niche. So we'll take a look at this best coffee grinder article here. Probably the first thing that stands out to me with, when it comes to the wire cutter is the, their content. And it's really well broken down. It's very easy on the eye on both desktop and on mobile. They use a variety of different text sizes they break up the content really well using call to actions, which again are only gonna help with conversion. And of course, the content itself is really well written. If we go back to the niche hub, if you want to call it that, we can see that within the kitchen niche, they've got all their sub niches covered with their most recent articles featured on the page itself. If we look at the URL, we can also see that that follows the niche hub format in the sense that they use a URL string that has parent pages of the kitchen and dining and then into the coffee section. However, if we look at this review, for example, they don't follow that same URL structure for every individual article. So the important keywords in the URL are still fairly prominent and not at the end of a massive long URL string. One thing I think the worker to do really well is to display the affiliate disclosure very prominently at the top of each and every page on the website with a learn more link to where we can read the rest of the disclosure. Now, whether this really does 100% comply with Amazon's terms of service and other affiliate programs, I'll let you decide on that, but I think it's, it's clear enough, it's clearly going to be seen because it's at the top of the page, so I think they're doing enough. And I think the way in which they've written this, Wirecutter is reader supported, it's being very open and honest and transparent, and I think we can really learn something from that. One thing that Wirecutter does really well is their internal linking. It is everywhere. Now you might argue that it's on the edge of too much, but because of how much content they have on their website, they can get away with it. And really it's done in such a contextual way that it will add real value to the reader. I really like the way in which they have this everything we recommend section where you can see every product that they've recommended so far. And it almost looks like that's the end of the article but it isn't and it actually goes on and they've got all of this content still to come. However, if you're looking to get a quick recommendation, 
you, you've got all the information that you need here and this will be fantastic from a conversion point of view. They do include multiple options in terms of where to purchase from and this is something that they do throughout the site and they do really well. One of the things that the wire cutter do exceptionally well and they have to do this really because of how many niches they cover is to really show their expertise and authority in the subject that they're talking about. So let's take a look at how they do this. We can see this section here where they talk about the research and each of these headings is linked to a paragraph underneath. So we've got an absolute ton of information about why you should trust Wirecutter, who this article's for, how it's picked, how they tested. So all of this section here, this section here, this section here is really demonstrating their expertise and their authority in the subject and it's also giving them a massive amount of credibility. They also at the bottom of the, of the page mention their sources, so if we click down to there we can see that they're using a variety of sources and they're citing these and again I think this is a really good idea. It also, these outbound links will also add topical relevance to the page just by the nature of the pages that they're linking out to. If we look at the types of images that they use on the website, they use a mix of amateur style images and product style images. And they also give credit to the photographers, which again is a nice touch and again adds a bit of credibility. When it comes to the call to actions, we can clearly see that these are product images. So these are just taken from the manufacturers themselves and interestingly they link the image to Amazon rather than any of their other affiliate programs. One thing I would like to say is that not all the pages on the wire cutter format in exactly the same way when it comes to images and some of their pages do actually just use product images. When it comes to the expertise, authoritiveness and trustworthiness again, the EAT, we can see that they also include a bio at the bottom of each article and that bio is relevant to that specific industry that that specific article is focusing on. They also include social media links to the author and again I think this is something that can easily be replicated on our own affiliate website and just adds that element of trust and that you've got a feeling of who the writer is. Now I've just come over to this best plugin smart outlet and we can see that it's structured in very much the same way but I really like the way they use these knowledge boxes again just to break up the content and that's something that I think the wire cutter do incredibly well throughout. They have a lot of content on these pages but it doesn't feel like you're just reading walls of text. They even use a, a newsletter CTA to break sections up. I think that's really clever. And again, it's something that we can easily implement on our own sites. Some of their pages also include lots of FAQs, and this is really good for picking up featured snippets. And they also do this a lot where they talk about the competition or competitors to the products that they're promoting. We know from the product review update that talking about competitor or alternative products is something that Google want to see. We know they want to see those various CTAs to different affiliate programs. Again, something that Wirecutter are doing brilliantly. But I think overall, the big takeaway from what they do is really showing that expertise, authoritiveness and trust. And I'm gonna give you another quick demonstration of how they go another level to demonstrate this. So if we go to the bottom of the website and look at About Wirecutter, we can see that we've got a ton of history here. It talks about how it was acquired by the New York Times company. Of course, the New York Times has so much authority itself, but they go into so much detail where they talk about their rigor rigorous editorial standards. They talk about how they choose. They talk about how they choose their retailers to promote, how they find and vet the expert sources, the, the citations that they make, and then, if we go into our team, 
we can see a list of all their writers and editors and, and, and so on. You can see obviously it's a huge, huge team, but they go into so much detail. So I think we can, again, I think we can all learn from that. Interestingly, they don't seem to have author pages, but I think they've got it so well covered in their about us section that they don't need to do that. Now you might be sitting there and saying, yes, but Jason, that's a, a massive affiliate website that I just can't compete with. Even if I create the same type of content and make it look the same, I just can't compete against those backlinks. Now that might be true. And to be honest, that's not really the point of this video, but it might just be worth taking a look at the history of the wire cutter just to see quite how they got to this point. After all, it started as an affiliate website, just like an affiliate website that you or I might be starting today, tomorrow or last week. So wirecutter.com was actually first picked up on the Wayback Machine back in the year 2000. And we can see that there was actually a big gap between 2006 and 2011, which was when the wirecutter.com started. Now, wirecutter.com actually was redirected. If we look at this point in 2011, if we look at wirecutter.com, at this point, it was just its own website and not a very good one. It looks like it wasn't really being used. But if we go forward into December 2011, we can actually see that there was a redirect put in place at this point to thewirecutter.com. So essentially what they were doing was using an expired domain, wirecutter.com, that had been inactive for about five years and probably didn't have a great amount of content or decent content before it, but using an expired domain to redirect to thewirecutter.com, which was a newly registered domain. Let's take a look. So we can see thewirecutter.com was first registered on the 1st of the 9th, 2011. And if we do pop it into Wayback Machine, we can see that, yeah, there was no history there before 2011. So let's take a look at what it looked like. Well, this was the first version of the website that I could find. You can see this was still in beta. It was pretty much just written text, not a lot of imagery at all, a far cry away from where it's at now. And even when they started to get a bit of structure going on, this is what the site looked like. Now bear in mind, this was 10 years ago. You can see that they started to have a bit of an idea in terms of it's, it was very much a tech-based website. And if we go into the content, let's look at this best sports camera for Go, the GoPro Hero 2. Remember, we're still in on the 2nd of December 2011 here. We can see it was written by Brian Lamb. So there were no expert writers or anything like that at the time, although he was a bit of an expert in the space, to be fair to him. Still showing some decent information here. They were obviously promoting on Amazon, but not a huge amount of content. But even then, they were citing their sources, which was you know quite good to see, but not very much content at all. The point I want to make here is that every site starts somewhere. That's the wire cutter. That's the website that five years after that date sold for a reported $30 million. Now, of course, that is an extreme example, but all sites start somewhere. I've got sites that started just over two years ago that I think if I sold them today, well, I've got one site in particular that if I sold it today, I think it would probably go for around $350,000. So it's, it's definitely doable. The question often is, when do you jump out? When do you sell? But that's a completely different video that we're not gonna talk about today. But hopefully you've been inspired by what you've seen today. And if you have, and you want to also apply the best possible SEO that you can to your website, then make sure you watch my video here, where I'm gonna to talk to you about my top SEO tips for 2022. Guys, thank you very much for watching and good luck with your projects.